challenges. Nineteen years ago, the young men of Britain volunteered en masse to fight for their country in the First World War. The motivation to join up was so strong that thousands of boys, some as young as 14 and 15, willingly lied about their age to enlist. Because so many boys concealed their real age, the staggeringly high number of boy soldiers who served has never been fully acknowledged. Now, new research reveals that at least 250,000 underage boys courageously fought for Britain. Many were buried along with the secret of their age. This film reveals why so many boys were allowed to illegally enlist and how the British government repeatedly turned the blind eye. There has been fraud, deceit and lying practiced by the War Office. You have taken boys of ages 15, 16 and 17 rather than face the issue of conscription. firepower of mass-produced rifles, machine guns, and heavy artillery became more than a million casualties altogether. And Britain's small regular army suffered heavy losses. Britain's Secretary of State for War, Lord Kitchener, urgently needed to raise a hundred thousand volunteers to bolster the nation's undermanned army. Kitchener's propaganda campaign was a huge success. Three quarters of a million volunteered in just two months, including an untold number of boys under the legal enlistment age of 18. Thousands of young boys went to the recruitment stations out of patriotic reasons, but also because they were responding to a national emergency. In fact, on one day, there were as many recruits in a 24-hour period than there was usually annually across the whole of the British Army. Amongst the first to answer the call was Tommy Gay, a 16-year-old messenger boy from London. He would prove to be a remarkable survivor. I had to go in the army because Lord Kitchener, he put a poster on the wall and he said, we want you, we want you. When we went to the door, the man said, oh yes, you're just the lads we want. And I was 15 when I had to go in the army, but I said I was 18. Also amongst Kitchener's new recruits Mate. was Dick Trafford. Richard Trafford. A 15-year-old coal miner from Lancashire. Age? 18. I was only 15 when I joined up. What are you doing, sir? The sergeant, he said, what do you want, sonny? I'm going to go with the lads. You're not old enough. What is that? I'm 18. If you don't believe me, I'll go home and get my birth certificate. Oh, he said, it's all right, I'll take your word for it. From then onwards, I will say, 18. With no compulsion to show a birth certificate, boys could lie about their age, and once they'd signed their enlistment form, they duly became British soldiers. Where's your wife and repeat after me? I am Richard Trafford. I am Richard Trafford. Boys like Dick Trafford. God took the oath to fight for king and country, had been brought up on stories of military glory, and the idea of war was a heroic adventure. Many of the nation's youth were members of uniformed organizations, like the Boys' Brigade and the Scouts, which instilled a sense of patriotic duty. Government policy stated unequivocally that these young boys were not eligible to join up, as the minimum age for enlistment was 18, and the minimum for service overseas was 19. So help me God. The main government's 
spokesman was Under Secretary of State for War, Harold Tennant. The lowest age at which a man may be accepted for the regular army is 19, and no man can be accepted for direct enlistment unless he gives his age on attestation as 19 or over. However, in drill halls up and down the country, the reality of recruitment was very different. Horace Isles. Among the very youngest to enlist was Horace Isles, who joined the Leeds Pals in September 1914. He was only 14 years old. Horace Isles presented himself for enlistment as all the other boys had done at a recruiting office. It was easy to become a soldier at that time for a boy who was underage. No one was really that interested in questioning him about his, his real age or asking for a birth certificate. They wanted to get as many men into the army as fast as they could. It was as simple as that. There was a mood of euphoria as communities of men all over Britain signed up for the war. But one man went against public opinion. Arthur Markham, an entrepreneur from a wealthy mining family and Liberal MP for Mansfield, began to question why boys were being accepted into the British Army. Some 5,000 men have joined the new army from the collieries and works with which I am associated. They were enlisted many months before they could be equipped even with rifles. Boys of 16 and 17 have been enlisted, who are useless now, but who, in a prolonged war, may be invaluable later on. For Arthur Markham, the issue of boys' soldiers was a financial issue. It was a waste of British resources, government resources, sending these boys out to France. It was also a compassionate issue. You could not expect boys of 14 and 15 to undertake the onerous jobs of frontline service. In the months to come, Markham would become the public voice of parents desperate to get their underage sons out of the army. However, at the outset of war, many parents were unaware their boys had even enlisted. I got home and I told, told my parents and my mother played hell. Said I'm not right at my age. And, and his, her, my father said, let him go if he wants to. Tommy Gay was another boy who secretly joined up against the wishes of his parents. So I could, when I got home, I got the biggest baking and good hiding that I've ever had in my life. My mother, she hit me hard. I went bang against the wall. She smacked me again. Some of the young boys who joined up were also leaving behind girlfriends. One of them was Florence Billington, whose sweetheart was having second thoughts about having enlisted. We were desperately in love with each other, really fell for each other, had a crush. Thinking of him day and night, me was me. And we made, we made that promise that as soon as the war was over, which was about Christmas, we'd get engaged. It was a promise. In fact, we said, so that was a promise he went away with in his heart, but it wouldn't be for long. He was worried to death, and I was trying to comfort him. I didn't know what to say, I knew nothing about war or anything like that, but all I could do was to tell him to look on the bright side, that there were better days in store when it was all over, but he was quite convinced that he, he, was, he was going to be killed. The patriotic volunteers of Kitchener's new army were prepared for frontline duty, and the boys took their place alongside older men as they were trained to kill. We saw these boys, and they were all sticking bayonets into sacks of straw on the trees. And they were running towards them and told just whereabouts in the sack that bayonet had to go. So then we knew what that was. 
because it would only be a day or two later that they had to go and, and do that to the Germans. But the war escalating, 16-year-old Tommy Gay, 15-year-old Dick Trafford, and 14-year-old Horace Arnold were ready to take their place in the British Army. The popular conception was that the war would be over by Christmas. Um, that was the public sentiment. However, senior commanders knew, Kitchener included, that it was going to last a lot longer. For the boys themselves, they believed, hey, it would be six months abroad, see a foreign country, and when they came back, everyone loves a hero. There was a grand swell of patriotic pride as the volunteers left Britain ready to fight the Germans. Among some of thousands of boy soldiers, dreaming of glory, unaware of the horror that lay ahead. By mid-1915, the first divisions of Kitchener's new volunteer army began to arrive in France. Some of these soldiers had lied about their age and enlisted even though they were only 14 and 15 years old. As the government turned a blind eye, Liberal MP Arthur Markham became an outspoken critic of the recruitment drive that had sent underage boys to the front line. In my constituency, boys of 15 and 16 have been and are being recruited, and the government are perfectly aware of it. Are we to understand it is the policy of this government to take underage boys of 15 and 16 when they have set down a definite age for which boys may be enlisted. Surely no system of enlistment can be satisfactory which allows boys like that to be taken. Arthur Martin was directing his anger towards the main government spokesman, Under Secretary of State for War, Harold Tennant. The War Office well knows that the declarations made by such boys and made for patriotic reasons are false. Tennant took the line that these boys had lied, had written on the dotted line, had signed saying, I'm 19 years old. For him, the fact that they were 15 and 16 or 17 years old was almost an irrelevance. They'd lied, they'd said that they were that age, and officially, legally, as far as he was concerned, they were old enough to be out. As Arthur Markham was confronting the government, Dick Trafford, who had lied about his age to enlist, was preparing for frontline duty. He had just turned 16, but was still three years younger than the minimum legal age laid down by the government to fight. Well, we didn't think anything about it, really speaking. We were just soaking in our stories, a young fella, all full of beans, you know, who wanted to be a soldier and all this kind of business. <laughs> it was one of the lads kind of thing. He never entered, he never entered your age, really. To think about what, what the results were supposed to be. When these first battalions went out, boys such as Dick Trafford would have had no idea of the danger he was going to go into and the sheer horror of what he was going to see. Amy Bernstein, a Jewish East End boy, also arrived at the front line in June 1915. School records show he was just 16 when he enlisted, and that he was the son of an immigrant family. He was so determined to fight, he had to tell a string of lies to join the army. Abraham wasn't a British subject, so he was ineligible to serve. In common with many thousands of other lads, he had to lie about his age to get in, but because of his nationality, he also had to lie about that. He signed on as an Englishman. With a name like Deverstein, maybe that could come into question, so he lied three times and changed his surname to Harris. So he served as um, 1799 Abraham Harris with the 11th Middlesex Regiment. Dear Mother, I have arrived safe and everything is alright. I was very sorry to leave you and very sorry to see you cry so much as you did. But never mind. I will come home one day, so be happy at home. 
as a lot of luck, you first try to hold on me. From your loving son, A.B. Another underage recruit amongst the new arrivals in France was Smiler Marshall. Like many new recruits, Smiler and his 17-year-old son Lenny were hungry for action. My best friend, Lenny Percival, he said, let me have a go, Smiler. Then I could see him falling. He just broke <coughs> out and spit up a little blood. Don't worry, then I said, you've got a blighty one. I said, I, when I get a chance, I'll write to your mum. A few weeks later, Lenny's parents received official notification that their son had died. People used to dread seeing the telegraph boys come on the bikes. It was really always that somebody had been killed. It made you afraid, made you afraid of that telegraph boy coming to the door. You didn't want to see him. You were hoping he'd keep away. You didn't want him because you always had bad news. The bad news of other mounting casualty figures was being published on a daily basis. There was a perceptible change in the British mood. The British public knew that this was going to be a long and brutal war by now. For those parents who connived in their children enlisting in the British Army, for those whose, whose sons were 14 and 15 serving at the front, this was a very anxious time. Parents of boy soldiers in Arthur Markham's constituency of Mansfield began to contact him. They wanted to get their sons discharged from the army and saw Markham as their only hope for getting them back. Looking at him, they would have said, this is just a 15-year-old boy. Markham began his campaign to get boys back on the basis that they had lied to sign up and therefore their enlistment was illegal. He confronted Tennant, the under secretary of state for war in Parliament. I do not like to use strong language, but when the facts are strong, strong language is warranted. There has been fraud, deceit and lying practiced by the War Office. You have taken boys of ages 15, 16 and 17 rather than face the issue of conscription. Markham was convinced that the government was collaborating with the army to conceal the fact that the enlistments of thousands of boys had been fraudulent. Have confidential instructions been given to the military authorities that the regulations as to age limit are to be ignored? Instructions of a precise character were issued to all general officers commanding in chief in June last. Since these instructions were issued, no cases of underage enlistment have come to the notice of the War Office. Tennant took the policy of saying, I'm going to stonewall you, I'm going to fairly well marginalise you, and I'm not going to do what you want me to do, which is to bring these underage soldiers home. Tennant was ignoring what was common knowledge amongst many families across Britain. New research from war records reveals that in 1914 and 1915, Tens of thousands of underage boys had been accepted into the British Army and were fighting and dying for their country. The tragic news of losses was continuing to reach people throughout the land. I was working at uh, Palace Hotel Buxton and one of the reporters came up with this uh, letter from the um, War Office, official looking. When I saw it, uh, my heart sank a little bit. I thought it must be something very, very important. And when I opened it, it was to say that they regretted to tell me that uh, Edward had been killed. I couldn't imagine life without him. The 
letters from me were found on his body. And that's why, that's why we could uh, find out where I was. I couldn't really, I couldn't really imagine him not being there. I couldn't imagine it. I thought, I thought maybe one day they'll find out they made a mistake. In the first few months of war, a million men had enlisted. But in 1915, the moon of patriotic fervor was beginning to turn into fear and grief. Young men were no longer coming forward in the numbers required to fill the depleted ranks. You! Come here! Now recruiting sergeants started to put the pressure on to enlist, even amongst boys who were in the age. What do in 1915, Tommy Thompson from Edinburgh was 17 and had just left school. No excuse, there's nothing wrong with you, you're a coward. I was plagued by uh, um, recruiting sergeants. They stopped me, I couldn't move for 50 yards without being interrogated. And I said, well, you were 17. He said, no, I'm the corner, you'll be 19. Pal Carriage, a 16-year-old office boy from Richmond, also experienced aggressive recruitment. You! You! You're You had uh, sergeants wondering about where you appointments and anybody who would look like a soldier would stop you, possibly stop you, and ask you to join up, and walk beside you, and try and push you to join up. Arthur Markham exposed these press gang tactics in Parliament and challenged Tennant to stop them. Does the Under Secretary of State for War have any information that a youth of 15 from Mansfield has constantly been accosted and insulted by recruiting sergeants who informed him that he was a rotter and a slacker? And will he give instructions to recruiting officers to desist from intimidating such persons? The government continued to avoid Markham's protest, with a war to be won and the more pressing concerns. The war had reached a stalemate by the summer of 1915, with the British Army dug in along 18 miles of trenches. But still, every day the trenches were pounded by enemy artillery fire. Life in the front line was incredibly tough. Royce Mackenzie from Doncaster, who enlisted at 17, was starting to feel the effects. We'd been in a rough time on it. We'd been three or four days with nothing to eat, no drink, no nothing. And we were booking, absolutely booking. And uh, our own fire step, you know, watching our own. I must have fell asleep. Anyway, I felt this tap on the shoulder. And it was from Lieutenant Newall. If you've been anybody else, I'd have been called Marshall. I feel the bits of shrapnel dropping around me. Shrapnel shells did, 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 did fire eye up in the air. They burst uh, as near as they could to the trenches, at the top of the trenches, you see. You could always see the shells burst at night because you could feel them. Amy Beverstein, who had desperately wanted to serve even though he was underage, was beginning to miss his mum back in the east end of London. We had to be in the trenches on Saturday and Sunday nights. It seems very funny to think that it's Sunday in the trenches. My dear mother, I do not like the trenches. The fact that Abraham began to feel a degree of homesickness fairly soon after arriving in France is evident from his letters. The overall impression you get from the letters is of a cockney lad, a young lad, too young, in the trenches, missing his mum. Driven by parents like Amy Bellastones, Markham persistently challenged the government to come clean and publicly acknowledge the fact that many thousands of underage boys were serving in France. Are the cabinet aware that many boys 
practice under the prescribed age laid down by the regulations have been enlisted by the War Office who have deliberately connived at this breach of their own regulations. Markham absolutely knew that the government was quite prepared to lie to him. In this country, no boys under the prescribed age as laid down by the regulations have been enlisted with the knowledge of the War Office. Markham, armed with evidence from parents about their underage sons, accused tenants of deliberately concealing the facts. I regret the imputation of deliberate connivance. It is wholly unfounded. Boys under that age are not wanted, either with or without the consent of their parents. Markham knew that the Under Secretary of State for War tenant was being highly economical with the truth. Does my right honourable friend seriously tell the House that the government and the War Office do not know that boys under the prescribed age have been enlisted? Does the War Office know that? Does it know anything? As Markham was stepping up his campaign to bring boys back from the front, Kitchener's army of volunteers were preparing to go over the top for the first time to capture the German trenches defending the small mining town of Luz. Amongst them were many thousands of underage boy soldiers getting ready for their first experience of armed combat. By September 1915, there were over a million men in Kitchener's new volunteer army waiting to see their first major action in the Battle of Luz. Of these, many thousands were boy soldiers. Sixteen-year-old Dick Trafford was mentally preparing himself for the defining experience of the First World War soldier, going over the top. You were just waiting for orders to go forward, to get over the top, wondering what was going to happen. You've got to feel like, as a, a, in a race, you, you're waiting to, to start off in a race, and you're just waiting for the off. The blue whistle, Officer Blue Whistle, one of the time to go, so the barrage started. He blew it whistling the whole call it to go over the top. And you say a prayer, they just say, Oh Lord, just give me strength to carry on. Let to carry on. They don't turn down and down and say, shoot you, shoot you, officer, who oh, I It was a case of hurt and seek in a sense. If you were quick enough to jump down when the Germans open fire, the, the, the bullets would go over the top of it. But there was a good man who wounded before they could jump. If a German machine gun on your sector opened fire, you had to wait till, till he stopped and then on a bit further. I expect to get in it any time. There's shrapnel flying about and all sorts, you know. And if, the, if you're lucky, you got away with it. And our lucky happened. It was hard, this officer. What was left of his face was shot away. He'd been hit by the full burst of a, 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 a machine gun. Six or seven there was face. He'd no face left. And as I pointed out to the priest once, he was talking about hell. I says, don't talk to me about hell, Father. I says, I've been through hell once. I don't want to go through it again. Kitchener's volunteers fought heroically at Lewis. But the battle did not go according to plan. Around 50,000 British soldiers were killed or wounded. Of these, around 3,600 were under-age boy soldiers. 
Soon after the Battle of Luz, on the 18th of October 1915, the trenches held by the 11th Middlesex were subjected to a very heavy bombardment. It was their worst day so far for casualties. 15 men were killed and 35 wounded. Amongst them, A.B. Beverstein. Parts of the trenches that A.B.'s company were in suffered severe bombardment. Uh, high explosives, shrapnel shells, whiz bangs, the whole, the whole gambit, the mortar shells, the whole lot was rained down on them. Dear Mother, I'm very sorry I didn't write before now. I was only hurt in the back. I know it will break your heart, this, but don't get upset about it. I will be alright. AB suffered serious back injuries, but after only four weeks in a military hospital, he returned to the trenches. AB's first day back in the trenches coincided with the beginning of uh, what became known as the Battle for the Craters. Within hours of him returning to the trenches, with all his fears and uh, all his recent experiences fresh in his mind, and his wound was probably still throbbing a bit for all we know, the battalions started suffering heavy bombardment. That is the state at which his nerve went. That was the endurance test, and he'd gone past endurance, couldn't go any further. In February 1916, A.B. left the trenches and made his way alone to a farmhouse ten miles behind the front line where he took refuge. After his discovery, A.B. was caught martialed. He went once more to his mother. Dear mother, we were in the trenches and I was ill, so I went out and they took me and put me in prison. And I am in a bit of trouble now. I will have to go in front of a court. I will try my best to get out of it. I will let you know in my next letter how I get on. Your loving son, A.B. A.B. was found guilty and he was sentenced to death. God only knows what his last moments were like. actually shot boys of 17 years of age. I know to my own knowledge of one boy of 17 who was shot for leaving the trenches under very heavy fire. Thousands of men have been enlisted in this country, and yet you have continued sending boys of 16 and 17 to the front. How can you expect to get any decent people to take the word of the War Office? Edward Bernstein is buried in a graveyard in France, close to where he was shot. His grave gives his age as 20, but in fact he enlisted age 16, and was still only 17 when he was executed. You've got the 17 year old lad who'd done his best served well, lapsed for just a short while after enduring a hell of a lot, and for that he shot. How can you execute someone for reaching the end of what they're capable of? Yeah, he was just a boy. protests were publicised in the press. Desperate parents from all over Britain deluged the MP with letters begging him to help get their underage sons out of the army before it was too late. Arthur Markham becomes a figurehead for the campaign to bring underage soldiers home. 
every time he stands up in the House of Commons, makes a speech, he gets replies by the hundreds in some cases from families desperately trying to get their sons out of the army in France and back home again. Increasingly, he's seen as, 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 as the one person who can solve this as an issue for them. I've had a snowball of over 300 letters from people whose sons had enlisted under age. I'd take some of these cases and confine myself to boys of 14, 15 and 16 who have enlisted as being 19 years of age. Markham took up the individual cases of hundreds of boys in Parliament on behalf of parents who wanted them back. And he controversially began to expose examples of deliberate resistance from the military authorities. In fact, a boy of 16 was recruited in my constituency and his mother and father went to the headquarters of the Sherwood Foresters and tried to get him back. And the authorities refused. Once again, the government avoided the issue by deferring all responsibility for discharge from the front line to the military authorities. The War Office will always allow a lad below the age of 17 to be discharged, providing application is made to his commanding officer while serving at home. In the case of soldiers serving overseas, application for discharge rests with the Commander-in-Chief. There were directives that underage soldiers serving in France should be returned home. These were not directives which were being forced upon the military authorities in France. They were directives which anyone really expected to be carried out to the full. Yes, if boys were brought home who were underage, fine, but it was not something that was going to be pursued. With a war to be won, most commanding officers were keen on keeping their units up to strength, and were reluctant to release trained soldiers who happened to be underage. However, some parents managed to get proof of their son's age to the COs on the front line. Very often there were cases where senior commanders did ask these underage soldiers, do you want to go home? And they actually said, no, we'll stay out here and fight. It meant that the parents who'd, who'd produced birth certificates could still be thwarted. Some boys had gone to incredible lengths to join up alongside their older friends. 17-year-old Cecil Withers had enlisted under a false name so that his parents couldn't find him or bring him back. To prove the there was one to the country and one to the family. Like they ways of the country. Not knowing where he was, or even what name he was serving under, Cecil's father tried everything to track him down. In early 1916, he put an advertisement in the Times to try and contact him. In it, he promised that he would not seek his discharge if Cecil would only get in touch. The Times, London, Friday, 10th of March, 1916. Cecil C. Godwin, all is well, will not apply for this charge if you send full arrest. Don't forget father. After reading his father's advertisement, Cecil contacted his family. They kept their word and he remained with his regiment. As the war of attrition escalated, the army needed every soldier it could get. In July 1916, Many thousands of underage boys were among the mass of troops preparing for the great offensive on the Somme. In the summer of 1916, Horace Isles, just 14 when he enlisted, was preparing for the long-awaited big push against the German army on the Somme, which it was hoped would finally bring the war to an end. Days, the British artillery had pounded the German lines, hoping to destroy the defences. On the 1st of July 1916, 120,000 men were ready to go into battle. It was to be the first time over the top for Horace Isles, serving with the Leeds panels. On the 1st of July, the Leeds panels were in these fields just ahead of us here, in their trenches, waiting to go. Horace Isles, he's been out in France for a few months, he's been wounded once, but he's seen nothing like this. This is a totally different kettle of fish. He's going over the top for the very first time. As 
Horace had bounced across these fields here, he would have seen hell on earth, basically. Bullets sparking off the barbed wire behind them, shells falling. It was an absolute cacophony of noise. All you would see was guys going down, left, right and centre, absolutely all around you. You can only imagine the horror and the terror that would have gripped Horace Isles. What he would have seen was carnage, there's no doubt about that. Back in England, Horace Isles' sister, Flory, was writing him a letter begging him to tell the army his true age. My dear Horace, I'm so glad you're all right. For goodness sake, tell them how old you are, and I'm sure they'll send you back if they're only 16. Please try to get back. Your loving sister, Flory. The ultimate tragedy of this story is, of course, that as Horace Isles lay here, dead, in the mud, his sister was penning a letter to him saying, Horace, you're 16 years old, you've done your duty, you don't have to stay out there, they're bringing boys of that age home, for God's sake, tell them. When that letter was sent to the front, the letter was stamped, killed in action, sent back home. Here on that day, 20,000 killed, 40,000 wounded, those are the statistics. Of those, 2,500 were underage soldiers, um, 500 of whom were killed. Amongst them, of course, Horace Isles, um, but many, many others of, of 16 as well, and even younger. As the battle continued through the summer and autumn, the tragic loss of many young sons and brothers sent shockwaves through homes the length and breadth of the nation. Madge MacDonald's 17-year-old brother had also fought on the sun. My father was sent a telegram, but I didn't know he'd had the telegram. I came in from school. I think he was had been very upset. Well, he was his eldest and his, his beloved son, didn't he? He was only a boy, wasn't he? He was only a boy. And he was full of life. And he was full of laughter. And he did love chasing the girls. And, and I asked myself, he was at the beginning of his life. What did he know? He knew nothing, did he? The losses on the sun were catastrophic. 350,000 British soldiers were killed or wounded. Hidden within the military records is the fact that around 18,000 were boy soldiers. The sacrifice of so many young men shocked British society to its core. The tragedy had a massive impact on Arthur Markham. However, through 1916, the recruitment of underage boys was being dramatically reduced. Not as a result of Markham's campaign, but due to the phasing in of conscription for all eligible men aged 18 and over. Everyone had to register and provide confirmation of their age. Arthur Markham was in favour of conscription. He thought that those who were old enough to fight should fight. However, conscription was not an answer to his prayers. He was not going to be able to get out any more quickly those boys who were 15 or 16 who were serving out in France. The boys who had lied about their age remained out of the front. There was no provision in the conscription bill to bring them home, and their return from service overseas remained at the discretion of the army's commander-in-chief. Markham's campaign faltered. He had fought tirelessly on the issue of blue soldiers, and it took its toll on his health. In August 1916, he died from a heart attack, aged just 50. Arthur Markham was a very courageous man. He was a man who was willing to pick up an issue and run with it, despite being unpopular, and at times he was very unpopular with the speeches he made in the House of Commons. 
He was not willing to be fobbed off, to be seen as some sort of maverick on the extremes of, of politics. Arthur Markham should be remembered as a tenacious and courageous man. One of the first British soldiers to have enlisted was Tommy Gay from London's East End. He continued to serve on the front line. There was half a dozen of us lads hiding in a shell hole. And the German come up to me and he almost stabbed me, you know. He was a good man to throw me in. And he got his bag in on the end of his rifle and nearly stuck it into me. But he touched my chest through me, but he never stabbed me. And of course I went cold, naturally. The German took us, handed the shell out, and put us in a compound behind the German line. But that was a bad feeling, a very bad feeling. <laughs> yeah. Tommy Gay was held as a prisoner of war in Germany for two and a half years. He returned safely home to his mother three months after the end of the war in January 1919. Trafford, who was 15 when he signed up, also returned home in 1919. The first person I saw was my dad going to work. Of course, he's down to us, and I went home. Mother was there. She couldn't believe, believe it. Her own eyes when she saw me. She thought, I think she thought she'd lost me for good. <laughs> The heroic contribution of the underage soldiers in the Great War has never been fully acknowledged. I think that history will remember those very soldiers as a particular generation. They were a generation that was patriotic, king and country came first. Undoubtedly, they were also horrendously naive. They had no idea what they were going to let themselves in for. And Perhaps no war since, and certainly no war in the past, have they joined up in such great numbers. This was a very, very specific war which allowed so many tens of thousands of boys to enlist and go to France and die. Of the course of a million unmarried soldiers who enlisted in the British Army, an estimated 120,000 were killed or wounded. Many more were buried along with the secret of their real age and identity. Tragically, the true number of patriotic boys who gave their lives for Britain during the First World War will never be known. Channel 4 has created a living memorial to all those who died in the First World War. Go to channel4.com slash lost generation where you can search the database for your relatives and find out more about life during the First World War. Thank you.